Welcome to Jesus and Me, your place to go for Sunday's message from Kingsville Community Church. This week, Pastor Tom Harmon, lead pastor of KCC, continues his series, 12 Ordinary People, with Thomas, and explains that we need to trust Jesus in all decisions in all areas of our lives. And now, here's Pastor Tom. Again. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about the disciples again. 12 ordinary people, and this morning I want to talk about the pessimist, the pessimist. And you know, there's a pessimist in every crowd. Even Star Wars has a pessimist. Who's the pessimist in Star Wars, for all you Star Wars fans? Darth Vader? Darth Vader? Well, he's, he's, yeah, I guess so, but I'm thinking of somebody else, one of the good guys. C? C-3PO! Yes! It's always bad. I, I love it, the line where, the, the, where they're breaking the first movie, where Darth Vader is breaking into the spaceship, and they just zoom in on C-3PO, and he goes, we're doomed. <laughs> a pessimist. Well, the pessimist, uh, let's go to that cartoon. This is a pessimist for you. The pessimist sees the glass always, figures it's half empty, the eternal pessimist. Well, what does psychology today say about pessimism? The person is the pessimist is the person who sees the glass half empty. Storm clouds always looming overhead with no silver lining. Pessimists get a lot of flack for their inclination and proclivity towards negativity. Their tendency to expect the worst in every situation. Besides taking a toll on their mental health, their physical health takes a beating too. Pessimism is associated with anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, hostility, high blood pressure, heart disease, and lifestyles or behavioral choices that can damage and, uh, your overall health and well-being. Are you a pessimist? I think that for every one of us, there's some pessimists inside somewhere. There is that tendency at times to be pessimist, not maybe a pessimist by nature all the time, some people are that way, but being pessimistic in our outview on certain things. In Jesus' group of disciples, he had a pessimist. You probably know him as a doubter. He's called Thomas the Doubter. But I think pessimist is more suiting for Thomas. He's called a doubter, but really he's a pessimist. He does not have a very positive attitude about anything. He tends to look at the negative, negative side of every situation. We would even call him a realist because when he looks at an impossible problem, an impossible situation, he is not afraid to express doubt and say, that's impossible, it's not going to work. And so as we look at Thomas today, and we're going to turn to the Gospel of John where we get most of what's written about Thomas in the Gospel of John, the message I believe that Thomas has for us that we can learn from his life and his pessimism is that we need to trust Jesus in all decisions and in every area of our lives. If that's, that, that is the one thing I think that we can learn from Thomas and what flows out of his life and the lessons that Jesus teaches him. What can we learn? What we learn from this disciple is that Jesus is holy trustworthy for every decision that you make, every choice that you have, everything in every area in your life, Jesus can be trusted. And we will learn that through Thomas's distrust, Thomas's doubt, Thomas's pessimism. And so as we look at Thomas, we find Thomas doubted Jesus' wisdom. He doubted Jesus' wisdom. Uh, uh, Jesus was in Jerusalem. He had healed a person on the Sabbath. He had gotten into a, an argument with the Pharisees and the people that were in charge, and things really, really got heated. And they decided that they were so angry with Jesus, he had caused such an uproar in the city that they decided that they were going to, to kill him. And so Jesus left that region, the region of Judea. He left that region, went back up into the Galilee, up into the north, to let things cool off for a while because they were quite upset with him. And while he was up north, he got news that his friend Lazarus was sick. 
And rather than running over to see Lazarus, who was in the region just outside of, of Jerusalem, actually, Bethany, and who lived, who lived there, rather than, than running over there and praying for him to heal him, Jesus waited and waited three more days in that place. And then he announced to his disciples that Lazarus had died. Lazarus was dead. And Jesus says, but I am going to go and I'm going to wake him up. And the disciples said, well, if we go back to Jerusalem, you know, uh, the, the, the authorities are looking for you. They'll want to, to arrest you and kill you. And, and Jesus said, it's okay. That's not going to happen. Let's just go and I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to reveal myself to you in a way I have never revealed myself before. And you need to, you need to be there. You need to understand this. And I'm going there to raise Lazarus from the grave. And so we pick the story up there in John chapter eleven sixteen, And Thomas says, also known as Didymus, Didymus means twin. He said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, we're doomed. <laughs> we're doomed. Everybody's dead. Lazarus is dead. Jesus is going to be dead. We're going to be dead. We're just all going to die. Let's all go and die. Jesus, going back to Judea, he'll be dead because the leaders want to kill him. We might as well be dead too. And that's pretty much sums up Thomas' thinking. Well, we're all just, we're all just going to die. Really, Jesus, uh, uh, Thomas' problem was that he didn't trust Jesus. He didn't trust Jesus' wisdom in making this decision, that Jesus was going the wrong way, and that surely if we follow him, we're going to follow him to disaster. And you know what? In, in many ways, we can be just like Thomas, can't we? That there's times when Jesus tells us in his word to do something, and we think, well, you know what? I, I don't know if, if that's the best thing for me. I don't know if that's the best decision. Or there's times when we, we sense that prodding of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit in our life saying, I want you to go this way. I want you to do this thing. And we think right immediately. We, we put up a, a wall and say, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't listen to that. That might not be God. I don't want to do that. And, and we start to resist where the Holy Spirit is leading us and what he's telling us to do. And so in many ways, we're... We're a lot like Thomas. We're a lot like Thomas in the trust, in the area of trust, and in the area of, of following the Lord. A verse I memorized when I was just a, a new Christian, and if you haven't memorized this verse, this is a good one to mark down and to write down on a recipe card and to, to put to memory, because I found I had to use it many, many times when I got pessimistic, when I was afraid, when I doubted in following the Lord, that, that the Lord had the best interest, my interests at heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. I like that word submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. As I was thinking about that verse, I thought about how it's a whole lot like a ladder. And so I brought a ladder here. And the reason I thought about a ladder is because I was shopping for a ladder <coughs> a little while ago, and it was a, not a ladder like this one. It was an extension ladder, and it was on for an amazing price of just $49. And it was an extension ladder. It would take me all the way up to, to my eave trough on my roof. And so I went to the store to, to, to look at this extension ladder, and it was an aluminum ladder, 49 bucks. And it looked all right, and I got reading just before I almost bought it. But just before I bought it, I looked at the tag on the ladder, and, and it had a, a, a weight rating for how heavy you needed to be, uh, to the, the, how heavy uh, the, the extent to which it was rated for. And I noticed that I was just a, a little bit heavier than the ladder would actually allow. And, and so I left it there because I didn't want to be like Chevy Chase, okay, hanging from my, my roof, uh, my eave trough with the ladder laying on the ground. 
Because you see, when it talks about trust, trust in the Lord, what we're doing, what are we really doing when we say we trust the Lord? We're, we're saying we believe in the strength of what Jesus is saying, much like a ladder. I'm going to trust the strength of this ladder. The ladder in the store for $49 was for a kid to climb uh, or, or a fellow not as big and strong as me. And, <laughs> and so um, this, this, la- this ladder is, is rated much better. But uh, it, it means that the, 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 the words that Jesus says have integrity and strength that will be able to hold my life. That's what it's saying. And Thomas doubted that. And so we need to, when we say we trust the Lord, it means that we believe in the strength of the Bible. That it's not going to let us down. It's not going to lie to us or steer us in a wrong way. It, believes that we, we, it means that we believe in the strength of that still small voice of the Holy Spirit When the still small voice is saying, I want you to go this way, or I want you to go that way, or I want you to do this. And there are crucial times in our life where we have to trust that, or we miss what God wants to do in our lives. We really miss it. My wife and I had to trust that still small voice and leading when God was taking us into the ministry, and we were leaving behind us a career at General Motors. We had to step out and trust in the Lord. And there were times when we had no money, and yet people would leave groceries at our door. We didn't even know where they were from. There was one time we came home. We were in Bible college, neither one of us working, and there was money stuffed under our door. We never asked for money. We never let people know our needs, and yet God met our needs at those times because you can trust in the Lord. See? The Lord is good. You can trust in Him. And, and he's faithful because he has integrity to back up his word. Now, it's just not enough. It's just not enough to say, I trust in the Lord. Just like if I were to say to you, you know, I want you to climb up there and change that light bulb. And, uh, and you say to me, well, you could reach the light bulb. Why don't you climb up and change it? Oh, no, no, no. The ladder's fine, but you go ahead and I'll watch. You'd be like, hmm, I'm not sure that he actually really trusts that ladder. And so it's important that not only do we say we trust in the Lord, but it is important that we submit to that strength. We submit ourselves to the strength of the Lord and we begin to take action steps in trusting him. In other words, it's not enough to say I trust this ladder for you to climb it, but if I really trust that ladder, then I have to be willing to climb the ladder myself and trust in the strength of that ladder. I'm not going to go up anymore because my wife will tell you I'm the clumsiest person in the world. And I don't want to be the sermon illustration that you will never forget and laugh about for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and so Jesus is wanting to take them higher. He's wanting to show them who he is. He wants them to understand that not only can he raise Lazarus from the dead, but that he will in fact raise them from the dead as well. That he is the resurrection and the life. But in order to do that, they have to take the steps and they have to follow him and they have to trust him when he says, we're going to go back into that place where they want to kill us and we're going to bring life where there's death. And in order for you to trust the Lord, it's not just enough to say it. You have to be willing to take the steps and to climb it to get up on it and to step out. And here's the thing. God will lead you and guide you, but he will only lead and guide those who are taking the steps. You see what I'm saying? He's not going to lead and guide you if you just stand in one spot and stay still. But when God asks you to do something, you begin to step out, and as you step out, you'll find that the Lord is with you and the Lord is leading you and guiding you. And so is there something today that you need to trust God with? Is there an area in your life where you need to say, Lord, I I, I really, really, really need you. I need you today. I need you tonight. I need you in this area, and I need to give myself to you. Maybe God is calling you to a certain type of study if you're a student. Maybe God is calling you to a certain area uh, of, of work. Maybe God is telling you to take a promotion, or maybe he's telling you to step back from a promotion. Maybe there's an open door over here, And you want to, you know, you're looking at it going, boy, I'd love to go through that, but I'm afraid to. What do you do? You trust in the Lord 
and you submit your way to him by taking those steps. This is where Thomas faltered, and he had to learn that he needed to trust Jesus wisdom. And so trust the Lord. That's what Thomas is teaching us. That's what his pessimism is teaching us, that we need to step out and we need to trust the Lord and take the steps and stand on what Jesus tells us in his word and through the work of the Holy Spirit, and he will do it. Now, secondly, Thomas doubted Jesus as Savior. He doubted Jesus as Savior. John chapter 14. If we back up a little bit to John chapter 13, we find that Jesus is at the Last Supper. He's telling his disciples, I, I'm going to be leaving you now. I'm, I'm going somewhere and you can't follow me. And Peter asks him a question. Peter says in chapter 13, he says, Lord, where are you going that we can't follow you? Where are you going? And so chapter 14, verse 1, is the answer to Peter's question to Jesus as to where are you going? And here's the answer. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let's just pause there for a moment and and realize what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He is putting himself on the same level as God. You believe in God, believe also in me. The disciples believed in God who was invisible to the outward eye, but could only be understood through faith. In the same way, Jesus was going to go back to his father and his disciples would need to believe in Jesus even though they couldn't see him. They were going to need by faith believe in the salvation that he would accomplish through the cross. Although Jesus would not be with them, he would still be working on their behalf and preparing a place for them and coming again to take them to the Father's house. This is what Jesus is wanting them to understand at this last time of his life when he is together with them. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now, where is Jesus going? Where is he going? Heaven, to the Father's house. Okay, he's going to the Father's house. house. He's in heaven. And what's he doing when he is there? Preparing a place for who? For us, for, for, for his followers. So Jesus is saying, I'm God, I'm here, I'm going back into my Father's house, and I'm there preparing a place for you. And if I go, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Where does Jesus want you to be? With him. With him. Where he is. Isn't this so clear? Why is it so confusing? Why is it that religion has mixed this all up and made it difficult. This is so simple. So, Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way. Thomas then, now listen to this, Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Wow. Thomas voices doubt and pessimism about where Jesus is going and how he is going to get there. We don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. All the years that Thomas had been with Jesus, he still did not know who Thomas was or who Jesus was. Jesus uh, Jesus is, is... presenting to them something very clearly, and yet it's right over Thomas's head. Merle Tenney writes, Thomas is utterly honest, pessimistic, and uninhibited. Thomas despaired even learning the way and was not ready to accept a state of permanent bewilderment. And a lot of Christians today are in a state of permanent bewilderment about eternal things. They don't know. You ask them, are you going to heaven? I hope so. Maybe. Someone will say, well, well, you know, I'm trusting that, you know, the, the, the church will maybe get me there. I don't know how the church is going to get there. Maybe with a snowplow. I don't know. 
Well, I, 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 hope, I hope I'm good enough. Or I'm not, I'm not sure what happens after you die. I mean, is the Bible really clear about that? See, now, now Jesus focuses on Thomas' problem. Thomas's problem was that he didn't really know Jesus enough. He really didn't. See, we have a lot of information in the church. There's a lot of information today. In fact, you can find a sermon on the internet. You just get a sermon on the internet, and you'll, you'll have a million sermons pop up. You might even find me in there. But that information isn't going to do anything for you. What you need is experience with God to know him. We've got information coming out of our ears. What we do lack is experience. We lack the kind of experience you get when you come together and pray like we do tonight at 6.30. There's a little plug for prayer for 6.30. Why it's important? Because we need to experience the presence and power of Jesus in our lives. It's not good enough just to know about him. Thomas knew about him. He spent three years with him. But he had not yet experienced the reality of that. And that's what Jesus says. Jesus says to Thomas, if you really know me, You'll know my father as well. But Thomas wasn't clear on who Jesus was, and that's why he struggled with salvation. And people who struggle with salvation, they're they're usually unclear about who Jesus is and what Jesus intends to do in their lives. And so they wonder, and they go, I hope so, or I think so, or maybe, or golly, who knows? Jesus clears up Thomas' confusion in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says this very clearly. He says, Thomas, look at me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very clear, very articulate, no maybes, no ifs, no buts. Thomas, here it is. I am the way. You've got to look at me. I'm the way, I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one gets there unless they go through me. Very clear. Well, that verse is a problem in our pluralistic world. We like choices, don't we? We like lots and lots of choices. We don't like to be told, well, that's the only way there. We want to hear that all roads get there. Isn't isn't that the culture we live in? Oh, how dare you say that there's only one way. All roads will go there. Everybody gets to go there. And so the question then is asked, are there other ways to heaven? Or as a skeptic today would ask, so you're saying that Jesus is the only way. Well, let let me answer that. And and this is a good way for you to, to talk about this with people who maybe are skeptical and ask you that question. Jesus is the clear way. And Jesus lays out before us a well-marked path. Now, there's all kinds of other ways you'll hear about. But there's one thing that all the other ways have in common. They are all attached to maybe. Maybe if you're good enough. Maybe if you take the right steps. Maybe if you do the right things. Maybe if you go through the lessons Maybe if you present yourself in a proper way. Maybe if God's having a good day. Maybe if you pay enough money. Maybe if you get enough people to light candles. Maybe, you know, you you, you see the difference? Jesus doesn't say to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. Maybe. There's no maybe attached. And when you attached maybe... You're not dealing with a clear and well-marked path. Now, when we talk about having a way to heaven, I'm surprised that there is even a way to heaven. Let me just say that. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have become enemies of God. We have blasphemed God. We have done exactly the opposite of what God has told us not to do. When God said, don't murder, what do we do? We go out and we murder. When God says, don't steal, what do we do? We go out and steal. You know, it's like like we got a three-year-old in our family, and I say, don't touch my stereo. (laughs) What do you think he does? Oh, yeah, stereo, okay. Causes me stress. (laughs) 
And so I am surprised that God would even make a way because we are not deserving of a way. And yet while we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrates, God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for our sins. So I'm surprised that there is even one way, let alone a pantheon of ways. But what if a person chooses to take another way in their life? Well, what if they choose to take an unmarked and questionable path? My wife and I, we began our ministry in Bancroft about 36, 37 years ago. And, you know, there are very good roads in Bancroft, and and there are very good signs. If you go north, you can go to Maynooth and Birds Creek. If you go south, you can go to Lamab and Maydock and Belleville. If you go to the south uh, east, you can go to Peterborough, and you can go to, uh, eventually, you get into Toronto and places like that. If you go south, uh, southwest, you can get out to MacArthur's Mills. You can even find yourself in Ottawa if you're lucky. Hmm? They're clearly marked roads. But you know there were old timers there, and the old timers always knew of a path. Well, there's a path. You know, you don't have to go the highway. I know a shortcut. It was made by loggers back in the 1930s when they were logging up in there and they left some roads. And if you go down the road there and if you turn it, there's a clump of, uh, there's a clump of cedar trees. Now, you might, you might not see the road right away, but it's there. And just turn and go down that path. Well, that, that might take you right to where you want to go. Our, our son was meeting us up in Bancroft and and we were really scared because he got directions from somebody who said, yep, you just go down that path there and just, it'll just take you right along and down into where you want to go. And I mean, he, by, the, by the time they got to the end of the path that ended at a lake, which was not the right side of the lake, and there was no cell phone signal, and it was dark, and it was foggy, and it was like we were scared. I was standing out of the side of the road looking for lights for him to come because he was lost. And I heard stuff in the bushes and I knew it was a bear looking at me, thinking, mm, look at the size of that guy. He make good lunch. And, and <laughs> we were so glad when they got home because they were lost, because they took a path. Because they took a path. An unclearly marked path. And here's my reasoning. This just sounds like good logic. When I'm dealing with my soul, I want to take the road that I know I'm going to reach my destination without question. I'm not going to get lost. And there is one sure path, only one. There is only one person in all of history that stands up and says, here is the way and I am it, and that is Jesus. Acts chapter 14, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now there's another question that is going to arise, and I wonder if it arose in Thomas's mind too, or if it would if Thomas lived today. And if I were a skeptic, I would ask the question like this, then are you telling me if I'm not following Jesus, I'm going to go to hell? Or if you're in the church, and I've been asked this question by people in our church, shouldn't we be preaching and telling people they're going to hell if they're not following Jesus? Boy, it got quiet in here. (laughs) Why am I opening that can of worms? (laughs) Because my mortgage is paid off and it doesn't matter what happens to me now. (laughs) You get so much bolder when you're not in debt, you see. Well, let's go back to the scripture and let's go back to our story with Thomas. Jesus could have told Thomas that he was going to hell. He could have said, Thomas, you've been with me for three years and you don't trust me yet. You've seen all my miracles, and you still don't know. You've heard me preach over a hundred times, and you still haven't got it. Listen, buddy, you better get your head, you better give your head a shake and get your act together, or you're going to hell. Jesus could have said that, right? Well, why didn't he? Because it's not his style. Because that's not how he preached to people. 
Jesus, when he went out and he preached the kingdom and he preached and he taught people, what he did was he pointed people to himself. He pointed people to himself. And so he would point people to himself and he'd say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When he talked to the crowds, he talked to the worst sinners. And what would he say to them? Would he tell them they're going to hell? He said, no, he'd say, repent and follow me and I'll take you into the kingdom. And you see, this church, this church is not a part of the death and judgment committee. That's not the committee this church is on. We are on the life and salvation committee. That's the committee that this church is on. We're like God's Google map to heaven, okay? That's what we are. It's very simple. Here is our message, very simple, just like Google would take it. Turn right here and follow Jesus to your destination. That's kind of how Google sounds through my old cell phone, all right? Well, what about if they backslide, you know? Make it you turn right here and follow Jesus to your destination. You get the idea. We're not denying that there isn't a heaven or a hell. We're just saying that our message is a positive, life-giving message that leads to salvation. Follow Jesus to your destination because he's the only one that will get you there. And maybe you're like Thomas, struggling with questions about Jesus, about salvation. Maybe you don't have all the answers. Maybe, maybe you're confused about so many things you've heard in religion or, or heard from other churches or other Christians or, or whatever. Don't let what you don't know stop you from following Jesus who gives you a clearly marked road to God's kingdom as the way, the truth, and the life. All right. Whoa. Let's get going. Lastly, Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 24 to 28. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. That's a very important part of this verse. Very important. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Maybe he was gone to Tim Hortons to get donuts and coffee, but he wasn't with them. I doubt if he was getting donuts and coffee. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in suit to my side I will not believe wow a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them though the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. John MacArthur writes, he, Thomas, has still been a hopeless pessimist. All he could see was the bad side of things, and this uh, was just too good to be true. Let's, Let's just say that as we look at this account here, Thomas, I think we need to pity him. I think he needs to be pitied. If he wasn't getting donuts and coffee, where was he? Why wasn't he around with the rest of the disciples? I'll I'll tell you where he was. He was a pessimist. And he was off in some solitary place brooding about the loss that he had experienced. And Thomas in his own mind thought, I'm going to go it alone. I'm going to face this struggle and this loss and this grief alone. And in that way, Thomas is like a lot of us, isn't he? I'll do it alone. When stuff comes against us, instead of running to the fellowship and to our brothers and sisters and others, we run away from them. We want to hide. Oh, I can't go go there. I'm dealing with this problem. I'm dealing with this struggle. I'm dealing with this situation. And we get ourselves isolated and we get ourselves alone. That's human tendency and the pessimism. We want to hide. And that's what Thomas is doing. But look, here's what happened when Thomas got all alone. He missed what Jesus was doing that would have brought him healing and wholeness and health. He missed what Jesus was doing. And so Jesus appears and all the others are there, but Thomas missed it because he was outside brooding all alone. And it was when they caught up to him and he heard the news. Then he was sad because he'd missed it. And he was sad because I always miss out. It never works out for me. Can you hear the pessimism and the doubt there? 
It figures Jesus would come and I wouldn't be there. Why didn't he come to me? He knew where I was. Well, because he doesn't join our pity parties, right? He doesn't join into our doubts and pessimism, but he's there to heal us. And so Thomas is to be pitied. Thomas is also to be commended. He's to be commended because of his courage and his straightforward honesty. He didn't believe, and he wasn't afraid to say it. To Thomas, seeing was believing. Unless I see the nail marks, unless I put my finger in where the nails were, unless I put my hand to his side, I will not believe. So we need to be, he needs to be commended. He's honest. He doesn't hide his unbelief. He states it, which is a good way to getting over it. Amen? Yes. And then Thomas is to be honored. I think we can honor Thomas today for his proclamation of faith. After Jesus appears to him, Thomas falls on his knees and proclaims, My Lord and my God. This is not a halfway commitment that we find today where people want Jesus to save them from hell, but let them do whatever it is they want to do in their life. No, Thomas is all in. See, this is what pessimists are like. They're all in or they're all out. Isn't that true? Eh? Isn't that true? When I know something is real, I'm all in. And at that moment, Thomas is all in. And Jesus says this to Thomas, Blessed, because you have seen me, you have believed. That's good. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now that word blessed means not only happy, When it says blessed in the Bible, it means more than happiness. Happiness is a part of it. Every one of you who believes in Jesus Christ, that Jesus rose from the dead, you are blessed in that you are happy, but you are happy with God a part of it. God has been a part of you coming to that conclusion. That's why you're blessed. Anybody can be happy. But people who know God are blessed because God becomes a part of what they experience and what they believe. So Jesus is saying, blessed, God is with those and making those happy who he's worked through their life and they have not seen what they believe. Maybe this morning, Thomas has spoken to you. That you need to trust Jesus in all the decisions, all the choices, all the ways of your life. Jesus is trustworthy. He is strong enough in his word to hold everything in your life. But you have to begin to take the steps to depend on him. To begin to step out and he will lead you and guide you. And so right now, if there's that area in your life, with our, let's just close our, our eyes and just say, Lord, I give you this area where I need to trust you in. This decision, this choice, this thing that's in front of me, this, this uh, opportunity. And Lord, I'm going to just trust you in it. And I will trust that you will continue to lead me and speak to me and guide me as I walk and step one rung at a time up the steps of trusting you. And so I give myself to you in trust. And maybe this morning you need to really come to grips with the fact that through Jesus Christ you are saved. Not maybe, not but, not when, not if, but you are because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that John wrote to you because he wanted you to know and be certain that you have eternal life. Not just guess or hope, but to know and that you would have that insurance and and that you would place that faith in God's word and say, God, I believe you and I know that I am saved and serving you today. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning, you simply need to make Jesus Lord. That you want to step out of a half-hearted commitment to follow Christ into a full commitment to follow Jesus. If you would like some of our, our connect group leaders would be in a prayer meeting, prayer room, just behind in the, 
in the, uh, just off the side there of the old foyer, just behind the, the, the desk there, the sound desk, they'll show you where to go. The people will pray with you about that to make that, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me to serve you with all my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Thomas went on to take the message of salvation to India. When Thomas first felt the call to India, he was afraid. He was afraid that he was too old. He was afraid that he was just a a little Jew (laughs) going to this big country of people he didn't even know the language. He was afraid that he might not be healthy enough to make the journey. And so one night while praying and struggling with what he felt was the call of God, Jesus appeared to Thomas and said, Fear not, Thomas. Go to India and preach the word there, for my grace is with you. To this day, the church in India traces its roots to the apostle Thomas. And for any of you, who have doubted, been in fear, have struggled with your faith, I would say that Jesus would say the same thing to you. Fear not, for my grace is with you. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is with us. Thank you for Thomas. That amongst all the doubts and the fears and pessimism, Lord, you used him mightily. You taught him deep truths. And we learn from him today. And so we go out of this place in you. We go out of this place knowing that we are saved. And we know the way. And Lord, we go out of this place believing, oh God, that you can do the impossible. That you are Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. 6.30 tonight. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Stop by the cafe. Have have some fellowship, coffee, a cookie. Have a wonderful day. Let us know. Okay. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. If you would like to know more about our church, visit kingsvillechurch.com. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to join us next week.